Um, I'm jumping ahead eight years after that. Uh, this is 2007. This is a detail of a sculpture uh, of him. The image is a little odd over there, but shoot. Well, very good. Let me just look at this. Jump around a little bit. So this is our in 2002. I learned that into the Robert Duke Force Field. We were part of the Lady Bio in 2002, and we made this installation. <laughs> so what you can see is uh, this. You walk into this kind of all envelop enveloping room where the wallpaper and uh, the objects in the room were all sort of interacting with you. And there was a film above that repeated in this loop every year. Um, it was kind of like this, it was the was like this culmination of all these art and you know, artists for the past two years. And so we made our own universe within that, um, which I think is sort of indicative of like how we kind of operated within all of too. It's sort of like together we sort of made this universe um, that had some language and sort of a vocabulary and how it worked. Sculpture is um, sort of like the next step that I took in this evolution of my own language, where I feel like as a group we kind of invented this sort of vocabulary like for ourselves. And it became easy sort of like to have um, sort of take the, these words that we made, these visual words, and sort of apply it to our practice. And I, just to speak about collaboration itself, um, throughout this presentation it kind of comes up over and over again. And for me, collaboration is sort of you're involved in this kind of third line. Um, um, Brian Dyson and William Burroughs did this project together um, and talked about this, this kind of collaborative process where when you are working with someone, it's, you're making work that is neither your own nor theirs. It's sort of like this kind of like third entity. And it, it has some of me and it has some of this other person, but it's sort of like better than both of ours. But there are individual works, you know, in those in directions we wouldn't anticipate ourselves. And so I feel like that was such like a rich um, resource to draw from when I started making my own work, where, um, you know, the materials that I was working with became this really interactive thing where I sort of didn't have to follow these kind of art rules. I sort of had, we kind of invented these own rules ourselves, and I could just sort of like use those instead of sort of leaning on a conventional, whatever was conventional at the time for, for what was considered that. Um, so these are sort of just images that work in process in the studio. Um, that, that work itself was sort of like this really simple steel structure with these kind of donuts that were in it. And I think the studio, as for this show in particular, was sort of like this cumulative process where I wasn't necessarily focused on the own work, but it was sort of like focusing on this constellation of work. And you sort of build this um, back and forth between the works that was really helpful, where um, oftentimes you're talking to your ego when you're making work, and it sort of becomes this like blocking force where you can't go that way forward. 
and sort of like making yourself distracted by having to work with all these different elements maybe is like a helpful distraction, I guess. So um, this work is actually the last one in the exhibition and it became really easy to work on because I sort of had been building five different works before that. And so it was just like it sort of felt like I was just like throwing things up this one sculpture that just kind of stuck. Um, so these are a lot of found objects, but also a lot of Nick works that I uh, made myself and recycled. And the panel on the bottom is actually the space from a previous artwork that I recycled. And um, maybe similar to the collaborative process that I was working with in my as force field was I was using found objects instead of making our own objects, and I think you can see that in this kind of like t shirt that I and knit this piece so it's like incorporating this that way. Um, and at that time, Lisa asked me to sort of pull an artist that I was looking at when I was sort of making this work or like previous to that in school. But, you know, I saw this um, lecture on Tony Smith and uh, Charles Ray, this artist from Los Angeles, was giving it. And it was such an amazing uh, lecture because uh, Kiki Smith and Seton Smith, uh, Jimmy Smith's daughters, were in the audience. And it, it was such, it was so great to hear about uh, the process of Jimmy Smith making the work. Oftentimes, he would just sort of make these little pieces that have like all the neighborhood kids come together and sort of start making sculptures with them. And, you know, when you see these, this, this work is at LACMA in Los Angeles, and it's totally monumental. You come down the stairs, and it's sort of like, it kind of, kind of looks like a cage, but it's more involved in the, like a cage. It doesn't feel ominous. In a way, it kind of feels like this floating, heavy cloud. And just the idea of him working with the neighborhood kids at the office really so fascinating. Uh, this is not an image of that, same one. I got to see this work. It was in New York and Matthew Marks. Uh, it really looked like a dog. It was great to see like all, everyone's responses on Facebook or Instagram. Of someone bringing a dog and putting a dog on Instagram. <laughs> um, I think in school, for me, T.G. Smith was like the artist. I was, I, I was like, all right. I think I want to do sculpture because of Kiki Smith. And it was strange. I, I never considered, never thought the sculpture was like, I go into art school, you know, like I'm going to be a painter. I know that art in itself sounds like a too focused when you're 19 years old. But um, seeing Kiki Smith, I feel like, was a revelation for me. And I was living today for images of works that I was seeing then. So one thing I was drawn to is sort of like this, how performance sort of became sculptural. And you can see that the early work, the forceful work I was doing, that's sort of what was happening. These, these performative acts sort of were um, frozen into these sculptural moments, especially in that um, 25 minutes edition. I think it was this work that I first saw that I was like, oh my god, this is so wrong and crazy. <laughs> Maybe it feels differently now, but um, it just feel like it felt like so angry and righteous and, and just so awesome, just looking at the body in such a cool way. It, you know, for me, sculpture didn't feel like seeing Pinky Smith's work, it didn't seem like it was like, all right, pour concrete and put it into the ground. And, have these different rules to it, but I thought they're so exciting. Um, these are Janine Antonio. She's she grew up in Miami actually. Um, I love this image of her parents. Um, each image is a different uh, assimilation of her parents dressing like each other. So on the left is her dad dresses her mom, that's what's up. And Janine Antonio, too, is someone who um, sort of looked to performance and sculpture and sort of like saw this sort of 
it sort of bridged the gap between the two. And this work, I think, especially is one of the best works of, of the 90s, I don't know. Uh, so she used her mom's hair dye to paint herself into a corner. I think it talks about the artist's experience pretty well. And here's Janine sort of walking on this artist <laughs> experience for um, And Chris Burden, I'm sure everyone knows Chris Burden. So this video is the still from shoot. If, um, this is the last person in the show. But no, I'm sure I'll start next to it. It'll go a little faster again. Um, sure. Um, Chris Burton uh, kind of started as a performance artist. Did these really endurance kind of in performances where he felt like his life was at risk, and uh, it was. So like in shoot, he stood there, and, and um, this other person stood across the room and shot a bullet through his arm. You know, when you're when you old kid, that's like super macho. Cool. <laughs> um, but I mean, he's, he made very thoughtful work too. Like, this is an example. This is um, uh, I blanked the name, but he basically got these I beams and dropped them from the helicopter into a vat of concrete. And so uh, he's monolithic. In essence, he's making this monolithic kind of large I beams. Here we are again. Installation. He's got a nice kind of percolate. So this is Charles Ray. He's the guy who talked about the Tony Smith sculptures. And so seeing this work, I think you might wonder like what the connection is, but I think he's really sort of kicking the tires of modernism and sort of playing with how the body itself is sort of something that falls apart. Whereas when you look at Tony Smith's work, it seems like it's gonna last forever. And be permanent and never sort of move from that spot and sort of never have to be maintained. It's sort of like this perfect Stanley Cooper kind of moment. So Charles Ray is sort of the opposite where he was like trying to make himself look as stupid as possible. But you know the chunk and tongue and cheek part of Charles Ray's work, Charles Ray's work is uh, becomes really effective when uh, when it becomes this. You know, this is a scaled up model of a fire truck that he took like a little toy and made it life size. You know, completely kind of, it's not necessarily stupid, but it's sort of like, as admitting failure, there's a sense of like admitting failure or pathos behind it. Um, especially in this work. Uh, that's Charles Ray himself. <laughs> and it's, it was great to hear Charles Ray because even if he had like 12 slides and he's just kind of like standing like this, and he'd like look at the slide and then he'd be like, look at that. <laughs> and he'd like just look at it himself and then just go to the next one. And then he'd be like, look at that. <laughs> so I feel like I can learn from Charles Ray. Okay, so we're kind of moving to part two. So, as bands do, bands uh, stop trying to get with each other for whatever reason. I think we saw ourselves not necessarily as a new art, but even they got together, but it was more focused on uh, this kind of music aspect, and so we kind of just banded, which is kind of sad. Because I'm so good friends with everyone, but um, there's a lot of reasons for it, but we're making nice. 
<laughs> okay, so here we have this portal onto this wall, and it's triangular. And I was working with R. Peterson, and he was he previously been part of the force world experience of the cognitive. And we felt helpful. We had this sort of like we were still talking, but we we were kind of making videos together. Or, and force field and have these ideas as we're making these videos that seem kind of separate from this kind of universe that we're making the force field work in. Um, and so we kind of, after force field stopped, we kind of developed these ideas further. And so these are, this is kind of like a giant flat scale. We try to figure out what's the biggest piece of glass you can get. And um, it makes this virtual sphere, essentially, so I'll try to explain the geometry a little bit. So if you look through like a regular flat scope, you see like this flat surface, right? And you can try it. You can just kind of exist on this flat plane. Well, if you make that plane um, wider at the end, it, the geometry changes, so it makes this sphere. And I feel like this was a great discovery that led into all these different works after this. And so what we did was we, we've been working on a bunch of video and so we kind of just projected video into the back of this um, view and kaleidoscope and it's sort of like this is virtual ever-changing skin uh, spheres. This is a record album we made previously. So this is another image of the kaleidoscope. Um, this is actually feedback we put the camera in the kaleidoscope and then I project and it's getting all this feedback. So there's this like whole new sort of alternate universe that we sort of went just me and Arlo to, to explore. This is a good one. This is a cover for that exhibition. Um, this kind of precedes the image on the show, but so we made, we have these virtual spheres in the kaleidoscope and so we thought, what if we actually made these in real life? And so we looked at Mr. Fuller as a way to do that, you know, where it takes a triangle and makes a sphere out of it. And this is us getting the skeleton of the sphere across the slip of uh, We didn't want to make it apart, and Dallas was like, all right, I'll just run a chunk. Uh, it's percolating from the yeah. We'll just kind of run these more, and I'll get back to this. In some ways, I feel like I already talked about this, but... So these are the spheres that we worked with. Um, and it was a challenge, sort of, we're not neither our, or, nor I are really good with math, so uh, we don't have a lot about geometry. Uh, but we want to kind of like have that imagery that we're seeing within that virtual sphere, so we translate it into these actual spheres, and so we use that same visual kind of um, symmetry for these spheres. So this is us setting it up. And Kind of threw these images in. Um, I'll explain them in order. These are in order of those ones, but I'll go back to This is an installation where um, we kind of we did different spheres of different exhibitions and then kind of all came together. And this is sort of like the next iteration of this project where started with the kaleidoscope, moved to the spheres, and so we went to the symmetry, and then we moved into this, and actually the spheres spun. This one is it's still in it, but it's spinning, and um, so I'm like doing this on this platform that is also spinning. Um, so this kind of, this is such a regular lecture. Right? But this kind of moved into this next phase where 
I think maybe if I just pause a second, and I talked about this little like, vocabulary we made. So really that was happening with, with Ara and myself, and then it was happening with him force field. And so they're like, we we're kind of make, making toolboxes for ourselves to draw from. And so it was very easy to sort of like come into this. This is sort of like, there were all these elements sort of like waiting for us to sort of put together in, for this installation. So these are all these flat disks that are made on foam, foam core. And each of these lines are pieces of paper that we paint and painstakingly um, glue down into the surface. And then I have an image uh, later of the backs of them. So this is in Rome a couple years later. So that first image of the installation was just like 15 pinballs. And then this one became 40 pinballs. And then this one, um, we only shipped a small one, so we, kept, we made more. And so these are the backs of them. So they're, they're really rudimentary. We just get box fans from the target. And each of the foam core discs have these fins on them to spin them. So you walk through and you sort of have this, like, you're, it's very impactful to see all these like, kinetic designs spinning. And then you turn around and there's sort of like this humanitarian part of it, like this feeling of this kind of, yeah, not humanitarian, but this kind of walk away moment where you see it's actually like this, this is a very simple box and it's a very simple mechanism you can handle. Um, one thing about this, this last show at LA Moto was uh, Instagram was born. And so even though we had started this project in 2005, uh, when it was installed here, it was great to see like all the Instagram pictures that were coming up. It just was like so. There was actually an article about how much it was Instagram. <laughs> so these are just pulled from Instagram. Um, And maybe I just want to say, like, even though I feel like what I'm showing is sort of like this, this process over a few years, and it may seem like I had, we had some idea where we were going to go. And the fun part was that we had no idea and kept evolving and growing. And we never would imagine, like, the thing you can't imagine is like Instagram happening when you barely, when you're using Friendster to 2005. So that was the fun thing about these working. Together with someone so, so long, is that having this experience of this back and forth uh, with these projects. Um, is this indeed? Um, as I was putting these slides together, I just wanted to go through, and this is sort of like my daily, like looking at imagery kind of experience. So these are very meaty, this is very meaty in New York. And um, this is this Brazilian graffiti that is really specific to Brazil. Now uh, it's some attacker group in Hyde. And there's a joke in there somewhere like, how do you want to get him to do it in Hyde? You just have to go to this spray can. You can see the guy getting caught down the line. It kind of looks beautiful, actually. Um, this is funny, this is her bathroom's still the very days and while we were all filming. The thing too is that, that I think it's really interesting how it sort of worked um, since the 90s, is that how we kind of see our work now. You know, I really love these works, but I think we experience, it, we experience art in such a different way now, where these are sort of the ones that I picked today that I thought really, maybe you would never get to see, you know, when I was in college, I guess. But it's so great to be able to see these kind of installation shots. And it's funny how it's kind of informing the way you make work too now. It's where we're kind of making work that sort of just gets, it looks amazing installed. And then, 
I think it's always been understood that like you're going to photograph your work unless it can exist. But I think it's different, a little different now to have so like this be like it's such a bigger audience now where people are seeing things, um, and it's that awareness of that huge audience, you know, where you do a show in Boca or Fort Lauderdale or Miami, like the whole world's going to see it. It's on. It's on the Okay, the last part is um, this MVC project that I was part of. Um, so I got a call and they said the call was pretty great. It was like, well, we have a commission we want you to work on in the block of Morocco, and you have to go to Morocco to work on it. Sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and you also have to work with students to develop the idea of collaboration. And for me, it was like, well, that's simple. I've been collaboration before. But, um, it was a six week class. I had nine students. And I had never been to Morocco at that point. So, and none of the students had either. And it was this amazing experience of having to learn about a country, about uh, how an embassy works, what it means to have a sculpture in the embassy, how strange that is. Because um, it's neither the United States government or a Moroccan government that there's sculptures placed in. And who's the audience for that? You know, it's sort of clear when you post to work online, like, the audience is like the France, maybe, and like, the rest of the world. But when you have a sculpture in the embassy, it's like, like Maybe it's 10 little mouths a day that's in there or something every day. Um, so these are images from this kind of exploration of what uh, this process of, was involved. And so we looked at the tower of Morocco. And here we looked at like the I main Morocco overflows with art, like the, the rugs that are there and the tower are just like so amazing because they were in this kind of like in the arts of, of the medieval times, you know, I was bringing in people that sort of had the first person accounts in Morocco that we could sort of draw from. It was just kind of funny that we sort of like work blindly. Um, so these are the drawings that we kind of developed. My idea for the project sort of became sort of looking at the geometry that's so prevalent in the tower and um, Sort of thinking about like a totemic structure that could be drawn from that symmetry and geometry. So we started with the imagery that's sort of like is both American and Moroccan, which is the five point of star, you know, it's in the US five, of course, you know, uh, six point of star from all kinds of stars in the tower. But, so it seemed appropriate to start with the star. And so we kind of stacked that vertically, and then we're able to draw panels out or like sort of frames from that star. And so the, this is a mock-up in, in the chipboard that we worked with. And just kept sort of remaking it and sort of sizing it up in cardboard. And the great thing is that I had um so I got seven thing. Uh, the great thing is that I had two people working on these kind of chipboard models and then two people working on Rhino, which is a 3D kernel, and having that interaction going back and forth is really amazing. Where for me, I thought the people working on the computer was totally like blow away the chipboard people. So it was like really reaffirming to like actually be working on this sort of three dimensional model and see that there was so much we could learn just having it in our hands and just to work in a really, um, really cumbersome way, but also more intuitively. But it, then when we got to the computer, we you know, sort of had this three-dimensional model that uh, enabled us to like, really make these precise laser cut pieces of cardboard. And so in the end, we sort of made the model on chipboard and then sort of translated that into the, this laser cut metal that we um, rolled it together. So there's our cardboard model and the other model. So you can see the bottom corner of these bronze tests. In the end, we're kind of like in this midpoint, which I'll show you the sort of our midpoint sculpture. In the end, it's going to be this really uh, 
rough sand cast sculpture where uh, it's a resin body mold where you pour bronze into this really uh, rough kind of mold and it makes this really beautiful rough texture. And the idea is that if you had someone, no matter who they were walking to the embassy, the audience was, was there, so they, whether they were different or they were just like a person. So having this sculpture arise out of the same was it was sort of like a goal. So having this sort of really rough same kind of surface is the goal of the people. So then we inserted these glass panels into those spaces. And then I was looking for different colorations, so you know, red, red, base, and the purple model at least. And so there we are, you know, um, and there it is at the embassy we presented it, but it is the key and we should be able to use the structure for it. As soon as it came out, we also and there I am under there. And one thing I'm so proud of this, this image is that over here is Kiki Smith. And I was just so like, you know, when you see somebody, you're just like, so like, you're the reason why I'm doing this kind of moment. It just was like really kind of glorious to be in this kind of setting and you know, to be able to present a sculpture that I'm so proud of, but also being like, with the first uh, that really kind of directed, you know, helped me direct, or like pointed me to like where I wanted to go. So, so that's my lecture.
right? And going back to the slide, it's conjunction a little bit, but going back to talking about like the force field of the is like the great thing is that we, I think I mentioned this before, is that we work with really using someone else's terms for ourselves, you know? And oftentimes when you're by yourself in the studio, you know, you surround yourself with imagery that you find online or just magazines or like things you've read or you listen to. And so they're like, those are the things you bounce off of. But it's sort of like, we created this sort of like separate entity that had its own music and its own kind of universe, which I guess could be sort of, it could get sort of, uh, I think it has its own lifespan or that kind of really can't last necessarily, but I think it speaks to like how culture works too, where you have a highway going in the middle of the city and like, one part of the town develops differently than the other part, you know, so you can ride it that way, or sometimes it's kind of sad, but, you know, they're just out of, like, different islands, you need know, different things to happen differently, so. Her approach, her raw approach of being so invested in sculpture and so invested in making this of such magical, fantastic imagery. And so, like, her reach, like, her mind's reach is just like, so inspiring. And I think they're, you know, it's like, it's amazing to find something like that, you know. And I think you need that when you're an artist, you know, like, you need someone. Where you just like awe of their breath, you know, of their mind. You just can't imagine ever like, making work like that, you know. So I, I necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily make, I think I tried to make work that like, would plays and just wasn't going to feel right when I was in school. But um, I think it's more of that sort of, I think, you know, when you dream, you have, you go to all different places, whether it's a bright place, you know, this bright technical place or this thing, more earthy place. For me, it's like the, um, I think color just sort of speaks to this kind of universal language where you don't need translation. You know, it's like no matter what, where you come from, you're going to be hit with it in a very similar way to someone else. And um, I think that universality is kind of important in my work where it's been fun to go to travel as, as an artist and go to different places. Like we set up the windows in Moscow. I walked around with my laptop. Like, I it was really awkward because everyone working around me, you know, does not have access to a laptop. But then, when we were working on it, we had to set up tables like these, we set up the road tables, and had our, like, exacto blades and our paint, and our paper and our glue, and they saw how, like, labor intensive this process was. This sort of, like, broke down this barrier of, like, I mean, you're an American coming from so much. To someone like, oh, you're really invested in this installation. You have so much time to this. You know, we were there in the morning to to the end of the day, and of course, we to go. We typically get there like two or three weeks before the opening and we just work our butts off until the end. You know, it's funny how it always kind of works out. Um, so, okay, well, it's nice to have But I think that. Uh, Uh, I was expecting you to bring up Nick Cave, who was also a big picture. 
Yeah, the kid, I mean, he's, he's definitely a really good But it's great to meet him because the first time I met him, he was, he was part of the WC Cup weekend, and, and, and he was at the club. He obviously tries to, like, you know, I was working with students at this university, and he worked with, like, um, this community center in DC, and these kids that were these amazing dancers, and they had this workshop where they were making up this sort of, like, sort of, like, in the spirit of a like, kid. And so I got to see the performance of Nick, and like afterwards, it was the best dude that I've ever seen. Uh, he just started crying because he was just like so touched by this experience. And um, I really appreciate his work seeing that, you know, like how moved he was by that experience and how, was important, how important it was to have that experience for the kids. You know, it's the work is so celebrational. And, um, so fantastic. And I think sort of like that fantasy world I think I showed the kid. Um, the funny thing too is that Westfield as a collaborator wasn't necessarily just me. You know? And so um, when people make comparisons like it, it looks like the kid is sort of like, well, that was kind of like what we were doing here. It isn't necessarily, I, I think it's an honor to be in the community. And his work is evolving too, it's good to see how it changes. But I'm just going to say that you know, maybe another cultural experience was a set of work in China too, in Beijing. And so he walked around the city and similar he's open these like gates that open and you can like order a sweater. And it was the same machine that I was using, you know, for these that women were using the kind of like checking out their technique, you know, it was like, uh, it was amazing to have that experience of like, wow, I really learned how to do this one thing really well enough to like, I could just sit down next to her and make the same sweater. And so, it was like a nice kind of cultural experience. Yeah. Um, But maybe in terms of the subject of colors, I mean, it's funny, like, I remember the first time I saw a neon painting. It was so weird. Like, uh, there was this woman, Joanne Collins, and she was in my, school, in my class, and she was in the Stratus department, but she was totally out there. And seeing neon on a painting was just like, also like, when it's going to be like, oh, of course. Like, it's kind of like this silly moment, like, Almost kind of cheeky, like, oh, that's kind of like a labor color. But then, what can you kind of do? Like, what happens when you put that with, into a TV Smith world? You know? so, but it's funny to have lots of like, adult TV Smith voice, and then this, like, kids' labor voice. It's new, like, how they combine it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, something like that. say like how you never really expect, you know, you know, like as an artist, I think it can always speak to myself, you know, you don't know where it's going to go, like, and I think, so these are just like, um, you know, the pinwheels became this ottoman that eventually we, we found Sarn agreed to play for the opening of this of the exhibition. It's a like, it was great. Maybe that's another thing that Carla was like, you're sort of like, you're making a in some way. And I think that's sort of the negative amount of work too, is that you make a lot of it, and then you got what works. And so like, you have these like amazing moments where it kind of worked where you could have this guy spinning on this ottoman. And the, the great thing too was that the speaker thought either I would have this too, 
and it was cranked. And so as it's firing, it's like, woo, woo, you know, it's like this sound that like filled every corner of the room as it's fun. And it was, it was kind of like maybe like atmospheric music too that had like this deep bass to it. So it just was like, you just felt the music kind of like crawl across you as it's fun. It was amazing. <laughs> I don't just yeah, I don't just miss class too. I actually agree with where you do the impact so maybe right now, is there anything up to do with the work you consult with the area or um there was something up at the Del Cruz collection that just came down. Um nothing. I just moved studio, so it's a mess right now. It's kind of a visit mess as my brains, so um, I had images of the studio that were before. It was like moving two houses. So I'm trying to pare down a little bit more. So I'm paring down the place. Um, there's some more. Can you have your attention, please? The library at the Learning Resource Center will be closed in 15 minutes. Please return reference items to the reference desk and magazines and newspapers to the magazines and newspapers desk. Those using computers are encouraged to complete their work within the next few minutes as computers automatically shut down at close. You will check out any items used to so at this time. Uh, so now I must have been about that. Uh, I think, too, in collaboration, I didn't talk about this, is like how you're kind of taking these different courses. You know, it's something like you're using three fourths of the voice you're working probably to make what I have. This is very bad that happens. So it's a funny way to preface this, but I'm working on public art projects. Um, there's one for the port of my name and one for the key discovery that we're doing now. So um, it's new for me to work on permanent sculpture and see the outdoors of the public. And it's very fun and difficult and and you know, tell people and justify your decisions. And it's fun to work, so. And I guess it exists for a long time, so. Well, the last talk in the series is on April 24, on Earth Day, about um, eco art. If you are able to return, it's on a Wednesday night. So, um, there's some brochures for that. If you Thank <laughs> you. 